So our case nine. Oh, people, this is so sad. Raise a glass to the boys. Hashtag, where are the boys? We still don't know where the boys are because this is a nobody crime. Although, there was testimony that gave us a very good idea of probably what their demise was. You guys, I'm still catching up on this. Um, I will tell you who I'm watching to catch up. This is one. Uh, it's harder to catch up because you have to read tweets afterwards. And it can't be... People can tell you about it, so you have to wait for the people who listened to it. It's only audio. And there are some people in court, but the YouTubers, my mainstays, my main squeezes, listen to it while it's live, and then they discuss it and have experts come and discuss it, um, like Judy Ron and uh, the lawyer Maven, Jess, the Maven, the lawyer Maven. I don't know if I said that right. She has, she changed the name of her channel, but still the same person. Anyways, so it's, to catch up, it takes a little more effort, but um, it it is very important that we all bear witness because the foster care system is broken. It is part of the Harmony Montgomery story that I covered earlier, um, and it is definitely part of this story. These little boys, their birth names were sincere and classic. They were four and three at the time of their unaliving, um, which we now, um, all the testimony has pinpointed the timeline to maybe even a specific night, September 19th, or, you know, or thereabouts, of, um, I'm trying to think, of 2020 because they were then reported missing by their adoptive parents January, or December 21st of 2020. So, like in the Harmony Montgomery case, and like in the Vallow Daybell case, when children are not reported missing for long periods of time, of course, we can only assume that when there's months intervening, that they have, they, there's been a, a very bad outcome I guess. And so, um, but at the beginning, everybody was looking for these boys. They reported as missing from their home. Some of the testimony is, we've seen a lot of this uh, prior to the case. One of the reasons the case was locked down was because there was so much pretrial um, publicity. I'm more of gagging everybody before the trial and then making sure the trial is public personally. Um, but in this case, whatever. So, like the Valo case, this case, um, the witnesses are sealed. We don't know who's coming next. So who have we seen thus far? Some of the people we've already heard from. Some people we did not. We heard from the officers who arrived. We saw their body cam. It had to get in. The defense did a really good job, or maybe um, duty run, and the lawyer Maven Jess were talking about uh, the one defense lawyer Jacqueline's is very good at staccato, rapid asking questions to make the person just go yes or no, yes or no, yes or no, and it makes them very nervous and and like throws them off their game. So um, the officers, I guess, the first couple of days didn't do a great job. I mean, the opening statements right away we found out something new. It was the ten-year-old son of the couple that said he saw Oren be unalived, the older child, I believe. I get confused because of the different name changes, but I really want to continue to call them by their given names, um, which I believe is sincere, was unalived. And then within days, the other child went missing. This is according to the 10-year-old. Now, the 10-year-old, I don't know what his, I think he has a disability. People are saying that, I don't know if that's accurate, but they're saying like they're going to try to trip him up. Um, I guess they used the wrong form when they interviewed him. It was the form for a like 10-year-old suspect, not a 10-year-old um, victim. But then again, at the time, I don't know, was he suspected of helping? See, that's the thing. One of the charges was that they, uh, like, pressured or involved a child in the commission of the crime. 
So was it the wrong form? I hate to say that, but at the time, I don't know. He hasn't been involved, but I mean, at the time, maybe they were thinking that the parents involved this kid. Uh, we So we expect to hear from him and the children this coming week, and that is going to be crazy. So again, it started out with the statement that the 10-year-old saw this and that the parents lied and then the defense is, you know, obviously uh, this is shoddy police work and they never looked for anybody else but the parents. I mean, yeah, well, if the parents are lying where the kids are for months. And then um, there was a long, long testimony of Jacqueline that was put in her testimony. And let me just tell you, again, flat affect, not really answering, sort of whining, being somewhat um, unwilling, um, reluctant, like not looking for her kids, like like kind of petulant, answering the questions, not great. And she made a statement, something to the effect of, well, she would be crying more if they were her birth kids, but you know. And the actual foster parent prior to uh, the West getting them. So the, the children had been removed from the care of the mother because there was a broken bone and the mother um, had a reasonable explanation about a babysitter, but there's some weird thing going on in Kern County that I don't really understand. There was an accusation made that the people working in the system basically get quotas. Like the more they move around, to the more they make placements, to make a placement, you have to take a kid away from somebody, right? That the more they do that and make a placement, especially when that ends up in adoption, they get points or money or somehow it's tied to their pre, uh, productivity percentage. I don't know, but if that's true, that, that explains a lot because um, the explanation of these boys and what happens, like, so yeah, they got taken away and then the baby, classic, was taken away right away. Um, I, which is something else I never heard. I know if it's like drug addiction, I don't know. I don't understand, but I don't know the whole story. But anyways, this woman ended up with both of the boys. She loved them to death. So in listening to some of my main screen sources, um, one of the things I was talking about was Jacqueline's interview that was extensive. And I guess the jury got like an inch thick of the transcript that they will have. And it just was, as I was saying, very monotone. And it was sad how when she got to the part about like, well, they said, why aren't you crying? Did you do something? She's like, no, no, it's just, you know, like they're not her biological children. She was just very blasé. So that in, I was uh, making a comparison to the witness that was the boy's first foster mother that wanted them back. And again, the foster system is very strange. They seem to somehow quantify and give productivity numbers to the number of placements, especially ones that end up in adoption. It helps their numbers as maybe Kern County, again, allegedly, this is just what I understand from what was said. But it would explain why, like this woman um, who had them for, she had Classic, the baby, um, Orson, for since almost his birth, and had to give them up, and then soon after they were given, they were then to, given to the West, who then adopted them within a year. She had taken, she said all the pictures on them online are from her. She took thousands of pictures. Another girl in her home, who was a foster girl, had a mark on her leg that the school thought they understood that maybe her foster father kicked her, and instead of investigating first and asking questions later, they went right to. They reported it as mandatory, you know, reporters, but, I mean, the person came to the house and investigated them, and the mom said she, the guy was talking, and she said, please, like, please don't raise your voice, or he said, don't raise, like, it just got testy, which she said, you know, this is a common occurrence where these people will come in and ask questions, and it just seems to be like you get used to it, but sometimes it's tiring, and then they took the boys. And she tried to get them back, and the guy actually said to her something like, well, it wasn't 
we because nothing happened about that case they found out that wasn't true so why did they take the kids they took all three out why and the guy goes oh we just felt like you were overwhelmed why because she raised her voice like so you're not allowed to get testy or or say please don't raise your voice I don't I forget which way it went but I mean basically it was a great excuse to make a move make new placements get your numbers up if that is true that is very frightening it it, it a causes moving children around causes attachment disorder so the fact that they could move kids around and get their numbers up is frightening kern county california stop it like that's how you create serial killers and monsters like charles manson make sure they don't attach to anybody and just move them around constantly okay number two that woman loved these kids she demonstrated that she was caring for them they gave them to people who separated from their other kids um, didn't really feel the same, but they weren't, they just couldn't really, what, you know, they didn't really connect to them. And the brother of Trezell said that they were known, he's like, yeah, I mean, they were just, they were the youngest and she, he didn't see them that often, but they seemed like they were the whiny ones or the criers. And I'm like, oh my God. The, the West, Trezell and Jacqueline had no income other than what they got from fostering and or adoption no jobs so again there's something wrong with that system anyways so thus far the big moments um like the the police california's police you know again they had their body cam they showed things the defense jacqueline's um Ms. torres her lawyer seems to be the most aggressive on the ball very much an advocate and gets in some shots but there's not much to help with if you would say like Jacqueline said she had gone outside she told the police well yeah she went outside and she went down the street and she saw some other kids why didn't you ask them anything well um, I didn't really go down the street I mean I went outside and looked down the street and again that camera from next door showed that she never went outside and when they went inside I guess the officer the first big search warrant he found a gun that Trezell had and he moved it and put it on a bed in one of the children's bedrooms. And her lawyer's like, what, why did you put it on the kid's bed? And now, no children were in the house. And he said, well, I didn't know how the West were going to behave and I just wanted it basically out of their reach in an unexpected place. So a lot of snarky comments, a lot of like, oh, like basically the police didn't do their job. But that wasn't, that really didn't hit that hard. Um, the idea that the kids were seen as whiny, you know, in the uh, um, the thing they did to, with the, you know, with the media, that first, you know, this interview where he goes, oh, okay, all right, like, you know, let, let me tell my story that I made up. And um, the kids goes, now first, which is not how somebody retells something. If you talk to a cognitive a memory person they will tell you that's not how you remember a memory that's how you remember a story like your lines okay first I say this and then I say that but during that thing he, he called the boys rambunctious like you're gonna say something negative about a missing four-year-old that doesn't seem right and why were those kids by themselves like their stories didn't make sense um the biggest like bombshell was on day 11 I guess there were two women who lived in the apartment and they said um the one woman said she was on the phone with a friend who called her in a panic crying explaining that she heard some weird noise and then she saw these people walking they had a big uh, ice cooler they looked suspicious she said she got a bad feeling something was wrong and she called her right then and it was september 19th then um when the boys were missing that same woman called her back and said yes those were the people like she knew them from the complex but she recognized them from those pictures that they were the people now when she the person who actually saw this she was also on the stand and she explained it was about 11 o'clock she needed an interpreter because she speaks only Spanish. She said she 
was cleaning out the apartment. It was basically empty. That's why she heard this big bang and it frightened her and it was so loud. She looked down at the dumpster and she saw these two people walking away from the dumpster with a cooler. Like they had just dumped something hard and, it, and then she said they saw me looking at them and it made her feel a certain way and she said then they were like really slow and sort of laughed. I don't know. It sounded... I mean, in retrospect, of course, it's going to sound, whatever, very suspicious. But still, they explained that they remembered the date because it was when they they knew for sure the um, big dumpsters had been emptied before. So that's when things would be really loud. And that loud noise at 11 o'clock frightened her. So what were Trizal and Jacqueline doing with a big 21-inch cooler at 11 o'clock at night in September and then suddenly moved. And there was also this weird part, uh, there was a, so that I thought was very, those two interviews sort of uh, jive with the dates that the boys were last seen. And also, I guess the 10 year old's gonna say he saw what happened. The mom of Jacqueline was uh, on the stand also this past couple of weeks and she it was weird I guess number one she also only speaks Spanish so there's an interpreter involved so that does add to the confusion a little bit but she was like yeah she didn't really she lived next door to her daughter but she didn't really see her that often and she took in a lot of kids foster kids and she got Jacqueline involved but again they didn't really talk that much and she didn't really know the kids she didn't know the adopted kids names and, but but she knows that she saw them at the Cal City house October 10th. Uh, she knows she saw them then, but she only went out there twice and the time before she didn't go in the house. I don't, it was very sketch. And I don't know. It. I am sure she wants to help her daughter, but also that's what it came across. Like she didn't really see these kids. She didn't know them. She didn't know them. She didn't care about them. It, it's... It seems very much the overall effect of what has been going on is that these boys were isolated. They were there because the, these people got money for them. And it seems like maybe somebody got a benefit for placing them, like moving around. I don't know. It is it is awful. But the women hearing the loud noise and the one lady being on the phone with her, kind of hard to explain when also that's when the boys disappeared. So that is where the focus is. That is why they say... They never made it to Cal City. And the only person who ever saw them said they saw them in early October one time. But she she said it's not that she didn't know their names, but their names had changed, which was weird because, I mean, changed from Sincere and Classic to Owen and Orson. First of all, I find it very hard. Orin and Orson are too close. So maybe, I mean, I also agree. That's hard. But she said because of the translation, I guess she didn't. It's not that she didn't know the name. She couldn't really say them. She got them mixed up. That's kind of what it came across. But it was it, it came across more that she, to me, in the retelling, and I'm getting it right from somebody who listened in court. Anyways, so we will, this week should be a bombshell because the kids are going to be on the stand. And that might be it. Um, my main screed sources, as you can see up here, for this, the West Boys case, it, um, Sincere and Classic, or if you use their adopted names, Orson and Orin West. Um, Duty Ron, he's a retired New York police uh, officer. He has lots of experts on his shows. He's got other detectives that are retired, some that are still working as um, advocates and as instructors for other law enforcement. Um, he, uh, he knows the family, the birth family. So that's really interesting to get the take on the birth family's viewpoint as well. Oh yeah, Jacqueline said um, one of the reasons they moved to Cal City was because Orson and Orrin's uh, birth family wouldn't leave them alone. It, it just all seems, and the first foster mom said, no, she saw the mom. She came to every visit. It was like two hours twice a week or two hours twice a month. She saw them like in scheduled visits 
that a foster parent brings the kid to the um, uh, facility where the parent is supervised um, but interacts with the child for like two hours and, and she didn't make it sound like the parents were stalking her so very strange anyways so we have duty run I suggest you go watch um, his YouTube show is at duty run and then Jess She's an attorney, an advocate, and the host of the YouTube show Lawyer Mystery Maven. And that show, I will have it in my show notes, is at Lawyer Mystery Maven. Highly, her, um, like, Duty Ron is doing, uh, like, multi-day updates. He sometimes has um, Jess on. But Jess is doing, like, each day in court. Maybe combining two when they're short days. But really, if you look at her YouTube playlist... So, um, Duty Ron's great for having the experts. You really get a breakdown. And then Jess is like, no nonsense. She is going to tell you what happened in court. Highly recommend. I will be, um, I need to, I'm going to watch all of her updates. I've only watched like four of them so far. I mean, they're about an hour a, a piece. So, like I said, I'm trying to keep up with um, all of our cases going on and plus I had all that personal stuff so anyways but I will um let you know what I learn from woo, my friends and I just dropped a book I wanted to show you okay I'm uh, moving on it please like subscribe hit that like button I'd really appreciate it and comments below what do you think about the foster care system do you think it just broke down in this case do you think that's a thing that moving around kids could be like a quota thing and how bad is that and what do you think about the um I think more of us I think we shall at this point everybody should learn Spanish in school we should be a bilingual society most societies by the way especially industrialized nations are bilingual I wish I would have been exposed to especially Spanish maybe everybody doesn't have to read and write but speaking being fluent in conversational Spanish, it's important, especially in most parts of this country. And if you're in the helping fields, very important. A lot of the um, confusion in this case is that the people in power, FBI, is police, aren't able to fully understand and they need an interpreter. And it, it seems like their community, that community specifically, is highly Hispanic and Spanish is spoken by many people. So, um, you know, know your audience. Or hire a bunch of interpreters instead of getting more, you know, weapons. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. Hashtag, I'm just saying. Hashtag, liberal lady. A little bit. I admit it. I'm a, I'm a progressive. But, you know, better to progress than uh, in a music we'd say retardo. Yeah, we don't want to be slow. We don't want to slow down. We don't want to go back. We want to progress. 